Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Briz Science for September 2022. My name is Joel Gilmore, and I'm your MC for this evening. So excited to see such a big turnout here tonight. Um, we'll get into why very shortly. I would like to start, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight, and perhaps the lands that you'll be watching this video at home in very soon, and pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging. It's a great opportunity to remember that the first people of Australia were some of the first scientists in the world, and they have a body of knowledge which is still contributing to contemporary scientific discourse and providing lots of value. And of course, as we'll, uh, our speaker tonight has uh, used study of native Australian animals to um, advance her work, so that link to country is very important for everything we do. Now, at Briz Science, of course, the, if you, this is your first time here, thank you so much for coming along. Briz Science is a series of free public lectures on science held once a month at the fantastic State Library of Queensland, presented by the University of Queensland. And the aim of this series is to bring not just the best researchers, but also the best communicators to share the latest research and their passion for their work with the audiences of Brisbane and indeed the world. So we're going to have a presentation shortly. There will be the opportunity to ask questions at the end, and then we're going to head outside for some food and drink, because this should be a cultural celebration, just like going to the theatre, we go to the science. Uh, in terms of asking questions, we like to ask questions over the app. So there will be a, a QR code up on the screen, rotating through, we'll put it up again at the end. If you just scan that code, then you'll be able to ask your question there, and we will get through as many of those as possible at the end. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, if you could turn your phone to silent, that would be fantastic. Yes, there's that QR code. You can also go to the URL bit.ly brizsciqa. That's it. Freeze that into your minds there. All right. So it is my great pleasure tonight to welcome our speaker, who is La Trobe University Distinguished Professor and Vice Chancellor Fellow, Professor Jenny Graves. Now, she is here tonight in part to deliver the Douglas Ormond Butler Lectureship, which is about exploring the future of humanity through our ever-changing genes. And we, uh, some people might recall that Jenny is not a first-time speaker at Briz Science Night. She presented to Briz Science way back in the early days in 2006. So when the opportunity came up for Jenny to come back, we were incredibly excited for the chance to revisit this incredibly important topic and to see what might have changed and evolved in the last 17 years. Is there anybody here who was at that lecture back in 2006? So just me then. Great. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that clap. Makes me feel even older. Um, well, it, well, I can guarantee you Jenny was an amazing presenter then, and I can have no doubt she's only gotten better. So tonight, to ask the big question of why about the Y chromosome, please put your hands together and welcome Professor Jenny Graves. Well, thank you very much, Joel, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you for your perseverance, because this lecture got cancelled twice because of, of COVID. So it's, a real, it's actually the first live lecture I've given in two years. I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, so I want to talk today about sex and genes and chromosomes and what they mean for our past, present, and future. And, uh, just to tell you what I'm going to start with is some very basic things about sex and sexual differentiation. Um, and then about the genes we know about that affect sex and gender. Uh, and then I'll tell you more about sex chromosomes, where they came from and where we think they're going to, and particularly the rise and the fall of the poor old Y chromosome and what this means for the future of men. Uh, now, I have to confess that I actually don't work on humans. Uh, I work on weird animals. And um, I think you'll be surprised to find out how much we can find out about humans uh, from looking at kangaroos and platypuses and emus and things. So I want to start off just explaining how these 
creatures are related to each other because that's really why we look at them is because they're so distantly related from man that you can go back uh, in evolution and find out some very fundamental basic truths. So when you're looking at vertebrate relationships, uh, most people work on humans and mice because that's when the money is. But we're the weird mammal lab, so we work on elephants. And the whole point of that is because elephants are about as far away evolutionarily from humans as you can get. We last shared a common ancestor about 105 million years ago. So if we compare them, we go looking back in time. Uh, well, I've spent a lot of my life looking, as Joel said, at marsupials, and, and that way we're going back 148 million years. And then the egg-laying monetary mammals, we're going back now 166 million years. So we are going right back in time by comparing these animals. And you might think, well, that's enough for one lifetime, but some adventurous graduate students I had said, well, let's look at birds and reptiles as well. So now we're going back 310 million years. And uh, frogs and fish are even more interesting. I won't be really talking about them tonight, but again, the whole uh, question of what is fundamental or what is really uh, important to all vertebrates is what you can explore by looking, comparing at genes and chromosomes um, and sex in all these different vertebrates. Well, the methods I'm going to use are looking at chromosomes and genes, and I'll just show you now what really keeps all of this work together. Um, chromosomes are simply beautiful things. Chromosomes you can actually see down the microscope. They're made of DNA and protein. And you're probably aware that humans and other mammals, in fact, um, practically every vertebrate, has essentially the same DNA with the same genes. It's about a metre of DNA per cell, and there's something like 20,000 genes in it. Um, but it's chopped up in different ways. And it's chopped up in 23 segments in humans, and so we have 23 chromosomes that you can actually see that contract with, with protein at mitosis. So that's what chromosomes are, and you'll see down there that, in fact, kangaroos have absolutely beautiful chromosomes. They're much better than human chromosomes. In fact, they're so beautiful, they put them on a postage stamp in 2003. I must say, it was a new experience um, working with the PMG. They'd call me up and say things like, well, what colour is a chromosome? And I thought, well, I sort of dirty white, but we stain them blue. So as you see, they're, they're blue. And well, we can't fit 16 chromosomes on the postage stamp. <laughs> Does it matter? And I said, oh, yes, it matters. Let's just have eight, you know, one set from one parent. Um, now, we have some beautiful techniques these days for looking at genes and uh, comparing genes and chromosomes. One is we can actually see where a gene is on a chromosome by taking the gene, taking the DNA, and colouring it with different fluorochromes, and then allowing it to zoom in to where it lives on a chromosome and looking at it under uh, ultraviolet light. And that's where the spots are, or where these genes are. So we can compare that. We can also take the whole chromosomes and separate the chromosomes by their size and weight and then tag the DNA with different colours. And so that's what I've done here with platypus chromosomes, which are pretty hard to tell apart, unless we make some red and other ones green. And it's even better because we can use the chromosome paints for one species to look at the homology with chromosomes in another species. So this is what we've done here. We've taken the chromosomes from a Tamil wallaby and sorted them and tagged one green and tagged another red. And you can see in this species, which is a swamp wallaby, those chromosomes are actually stuck together. So we can look at how chromosomes have changed in evolution. And of course, these days, we can do DNA sequence. We can sequence practically everything. Uh, but that wasn't always the case, and we were actually fairly early adopters. Uh, we sequenced the genome of the opossum, which is a Brazilian species, um, in 2007, and the platypus in 2008, and that cost $40 million. Um, more recently, we sequenced the Tamil wallaby, that cost about $10 million, and very recently, we sequenced the koala. So now we're looking at about $100,000, and we're about to publish several more marsupials at 
five or six thousand dollars. So the prices come down by log after log. So a, a lot of people will tell you that all you need to do these days is sequence everything and you'll answer all the questions. Not so. You really need to know where the genes are and what they do. So I'm going to ask some very, very basic questions about sex. Or where do you find sex? Or in animals, practically every animal uh, does sexual reproduction, with a few exceptions. And most plants do too, although usually plants are not differentiated into different sexes. But sex is everywhere. And you might say, well, why? Actually, that's a very profound question because from an evolutionary point of view, sex shouldn't really advantage your genes very much because when you mate with um, a, a, a partner, you're actually only getting half your genes into the offspring. So why not clone yourself? If you cloned yourself, all your genes would be in your offspring. So as an evolutionary strategy, it actually doesn't sound like a very good idea. And very few animals go this route. There are a few lizards. Here's the whiptail lizard in Arizona. And it's a female-only species. And they reproduce by what we call parthenogenesis. So the female makes eggs out of her own genes. And there is no male partner. Now, we can't do uh, parthenogenesis because we need um, genes that come through the male, through sperm, and through the egg because they actually inactivate different sets of genes. Well, um, there must be a really good reason why you need sex, and that reason seems to be it's very good to have genes from different parents that recombine and make different combinations of gene variants in the offspring. And that can fit you for uh, establishing new niches, for instance. And I often show a picture of a, here's a proto-giraffe and it doesn't have long legs or a long neck and it can't reach the leaves. But if two giraffe uh, individuals had mutants, one a long leg mutant and one a long neck mutant, they still can't reach the leaves. And if you waited for the two mutations to occur by mutation, you'd be waiting for tens of millions of years. But if those two giraffes could mate and produce an offspring, you'd at last get a giraffe that has uh, long necks and a long legs and can reach the, uh, the, the, the leaves. So you get the idea. This is kind of a stupid example, but uh, the idea is that you make new combinations of genes that um, can fit, make an organism fit to move into a new environment. Probably more important than that is that it also makes new combinations of genes that can baffle your pathogens. So pathogens um, can invade uh, somebody with a particular genotype, but if, if the next person has a different genes, then the pathogen can't move around. And that seems to be very, very important. And we see this all the time in wild animals, for instance, that have lost a lot of genetic variation, like cheetahs and Tasmanian devils, um, don't have much genetic variation left. And that means it's a real danger that a pathogen will come in and wipe out the lot of them. So the, there's a power in combining gene, um, gene variants, and it's probably very important, at least for disease resistance. So that's probably why uh, we uh, have invested a lot in sexual differentiation. Well, how? Uh, well, really, all you need is gametes. You just need sperm and you need eggs and you need them to fuse and you need the gene variants to recombine and you've got a sexual system. But what excites people more is the differences, the way that these gametes use, the tricks they use to get their genes into the next generation. So this is where we come into looking at sex differences. And there's all kinds of amazing sex differences in the animal kingdom, and you're probably aware of many of them. So for instance, the male and the, fe the female peacocks look completely different. Um, the male has a marvelous show of feathers. The female is picky and choosy and, and picks the one with the best feathers. Um, if you're looking at ticks, however, it's the other way around. The female is a big, fat female, and the, the male does better if he's very small and just hangs on to a big female. So there's all kinds of variation out there in the animal kingdom um, as far as sex differences go. 
Well, where are humans? Humans are pretty boring, really. We don't have the, the extravagant displays of birds and we don't have huge size differences like ticks and mites. Um, but you can see there's a lot of variation. So this is just my lab 20 years ago and you'll see we've, we've got um, men, we've got women, some tall, some short, some blonde, some dark, um, and some boys and some girls. But you'll see there's a huge amount of variation within each sex as well. And that seems to be very important as far as, as defining sex differences. So when you talk about sex differences, uh, which has become very controversial, amazingly enough, um, you read all kinds of stuff about what are the differences in the average male is taller than the average female and so forth. So what I did many years ago was at meetings like this, I would pass around cards and ask people to write down very quickly the differences that they observe between men and women. And this is what I got. Um, this is actually what I got from a year 10 class in high school but it's virtually identical to what I got with the Royal Society of New Zealand. So I stopped doing it after a few years because the answers were generally the same. Uh, curiously, hardly anybody mentioned eggs and sperm, which is what sex is all about. Uh, they're much more interested in, in behavioural differences in dress and behaviour, uh, reproductive equipment, and I have to tell you, the penises and breasts, one hands down. Um, but when you look at all these differences that people observe, and I don't think it would be very different today, the, the one difference that they didn't think was very important that actually turns out to be all about sex determination is testicles. Whether a fetus has got testicles or not is absolutely critical in what sex they're going to become. So let me just briefly review how sex is determined in humans and mice and actually in chickens and fish, very similar as well. So when you look at a very young embryo here, it doesn't have um, any testes or ovaries, but it has a little band of cells called the genital ridge, just sitting on top of the kidney. And so it's a very unusual lot of cells because they can either form a testis or they can form an ovary. So that's absolutely unique in the body. There's, there's two quite different fates for those cells. So what decides whether that group of cells is going to become a testis or an ovary? It must be some sort of a trigger factor. And that trigger could be either genetics, um, and it could be a male determining factor, or it could be a female determining factor, or it could be environmental. And there are all sorts of environmental influences that affect sex. And in many species, um, particularly reptiles, it's completely determined sex. So for instance, um, alligators, if you take a bunch of eggs and you incubate them at 33 degrees, they'll all hatch into females. But if you take the same eggs and incubate them at 36 degrees, they all hatch into males. Turtles are the same, except it's the other way around. It's a higher temperature in female production. So how does this work um, and what does it mean? And is this going to be a problem in a warming world? We may end up with a, a world full of male alligators and female turtles, and that's not going to work very well. Uh, there's a lot of other ways of doing environmental sex, and my personal favourite is some social factors which actually affect sex change in adult fish. So this is the blue, blue head wrasse fish, and you can see the fish here. The only one with the blue head is a male. He's a single male, and he's in charge of a whole harem of about 100 little gold females. The interesting thing is if you remove this male, the biggest female turns into a male in 10 days. So uh, she changes her behaviour in minutes, she changes her colour in hours, and by 10 days she's lost her ovary and completely started again, made a testis and is producing sperm. So isn't that amazing? And we'd love to know how that all happens. So of course, in all these um, environmental sex determination, the genes are the same in males and females. It's how you read those genes that's different. So it's what we call epigenetic control of 
and we'd love to know how all that happens, and that's actually something I'm doing most of my work on now. Um, however, the way humans do it and other mammals do it, it, and we've known this for a long time, is by genes and chromosomes. And we found out in 1959, by looking at the chromosomes of uh, men and women, that they are different. So here's the chromosomes of a female, and you can see if you cut all the chromosomes up and pair them up, and we put banding patterns on them by a chemical method so you can tell who's who here, they all come with a pair. And that's because one set comes from the father and one set comes from the mother. So there's a total of 46 chromosomes there and they're all the same. But males, they're all the same except one. And that chromosome there is called the X and there's two copies of the X chromosome in females and a single copy in males. And that's why it's called an X. It's not called an X because it looks like an X. It does in humans, but it doesn't in anything else. Uh, it's called an X for unknown. But the other thing that's special about male is they have this little tiny chromosome called the Y chromosome. It's a pathetic little chromosome. Um, <laughs> but it is male-specific. OK, so what is it that causes sex? Is it the number of X chromosomes? or is it the presence or absence of the Y chromosome? And this was a real question back in the 1960s because in Drosophila, it's actually the number of X chromosomes that makes you female or male. But we know from studying um, people with uh, unusual sex chromosomes, there's, uh, there's people who have a single X chromosome but no Y, and they are girls. And there are people who have two X chromosomes but they have a Y as well, and they are boys. So it's clear that it's the Y chromosome that makes, uh, makes a baby a boy or a girl. Well, this is back in the 80s, and people want to know, OK, what is it on the Y chromosome that, makes, uh, that determines sex? And a huge amount of work was done on this. Um, it turns out that there are a number of people who have only got part of a Y chromosome. Um, and what... It, we could show way back in the 60s is that if you had the top little bit of the Y chromosome, you were male, and if you had the bottom, you were female. So it looks like the, there must be a gene in that very top little part that is uh, responsible for sex determination. And this was all in the 80s. I actually wasn't working on sex at all in those days. I was working on sex chromosomes and sex chromosome inactivation. Uh, but I was really thrilled when it was published, uh, the discovery of a gene, the first gene on the human's Y chromosome called ZFY. And it looked like a really good candidate for being the sex determining gene. Um, and David Page, who discovered, called me up and said, would I mind mapping it in kangaroos because it should be on the Y chromosome in a kangaroo too. Well, uh, I got two of my students working on this, uh, Andrew Sinclair and Jamie Foster, and they quickly discovered it was not on the Y, it was actually on chromosome 3 in a kangaroo, uh, sorry, 5 in a kangaroo, which is a very strange place for a sex-determining gene. Um, and so the boys got uh, a really good front page cover on, in Nature for their pains because they discovered that this gene is in the wrong place. It's got to be the wrong gene. Andrew Sinclair then went off to London to do a postdoc with Peter Goodfellow, and it was he who discovered the right gene, which is called SRY, for sex gene, sex region on the Y chromosome. And we know that's the right gene because if there's a mutation in it, um, the baby is a girl. Jamie Foster came back to my lab, and it was he who accidentally discovered that SRY has another gene that is very similar on the X chromosome called SOX3. And we discovered that that's actually the ancestor of the SRY gene. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later. And he also went on to discover another very similar gene called SOX9, which is actually critical for male sex determination, and it's a direct target of the SRY gene. So that was all in the 80s and 90s. We sort of thought, oh, well, we've sort of solved that one. We know what gene it is. It should be really easy now to figure out how it all happens. 
And we thought, well, how does SIOI work? Um, we know from uh, work done in the 50s that the factor on the Y chromosome, the test is determining factor, switches the, triggers the uh, differentiation of a testis in the embryo. The embryonic testis makes male hormones, and it's the hormones that make the baby male. So all we had to do is figure out, well, how does SIY work to make a testis? We thought maybe there are a few steps, you know, A, B, B, and C to make a testis, and maybe there are a few upstream uh, steps as well. Uh, well, uh, 30 years later, we're still finding genes that are in this pathway. It's not a simple pathway. It looks more like that. That's a simplified version of how SRY um, diverts differentiation into a testis. So there's a bipotential gonad that could go either way. If SRY is there, it activates SOX9, and it's SOX9 that's largely responsible for making a testis. If there's no SRY, you get a bunch of other genes that now are ovary determining genes. But you can see that actually these two pathways interact. Um, SOX9 actually represses the female pathway, and beta um and FG, FGFR2 uh, suppress SOX9. So they're actually pushing and pulling. It's a real sort of uh, push me, pull you. It's not really a pathway, it's sort of a network. And the way all this was discovered was largely looking at humans who had some unusual characteristics of sex determination. Um, and so you could figure out what part of the pathway is acting uh, more strongly or less strongly because it's a balance of male and female. Well, this is what the pathway, I think, is a, a better description of the pathway is there's, there's, it's kind of mad. There's little blue balls running anywhere and they're getting squashed and they're getting made and they're getting reconstituted. And so if you start with the genital ridge up the top left there, um, if the blue ball end, enters the bipotential gonad, you get testis determination, but if it doesn't, you get ovary. So I think that's a, a really nice description of um, the complexity of it. And of course, if you've got all those genes, at least 60 of them, they're going to have variation in a lot of those genes. So there's a tremendous lot of variation just in making a testis or an ovary. But that's only the beginning. The testis and the ovary um, then have to go through a number of steps in order to make hormones. And you've probably been told, okay, we have sex hormones, androgens and estrogens. Uh, well, that's not the half of it. There's actually lots of hormones and they're all made from cholesterol and they all have a very similar structure, but uh, a lot of genes are just, just putting on a hydroxyl group here or a methyl group there. And these hormones actually have quite different effects on the body. So, um, you may think, oh, well, that's easy. The test makes androgens, and so you get a male, and the uh, ovary makes estrogen, so you get a female. That's really not the way it works at all. Both of them make both. Uh, both male and female have both hormones. In and again, you have all sorts of variants which have different ratios of male and female hormones. So the whole hormone field is, is really complex and full of variation. So it's not surprising that you also get a lot of variation in physical development. So um, unlike uh, some birds and, and some ticks, uh, the body plan of males and females is pretty much the same. There's slight differences in growth here and growth there. The real differences are in the genitals and in the, particularly in the, um, in the uh, sex cells they make, sperm or eggs. Uh, you get breast development in, in females. But what people don't tell you about is the brain is also uh, the target of a lot of hormones and probably also some of the genes involved in sex in the first place. So again, you have a tremendous amount of variation in, um, and some of it's quite trivial, uh, some of it's more profound, in the f uh, physical development of males and females. But in particular, you get a lot of variation in, um, in brain and in the feeling. Um, so when we talk about gender, we're really talking more about the brain than we are about um, the, the genitals or the breasts and so forth. So again, we've always been taught that there's really you're either male or you're female. 
Um, and that's, that may be true for uh, the majority of people, but we now know that there's a tremendous spread of maleness and femaleness, and a lot of that is in the brain. Uh, and so I've often thought, well, I bet there are genes that make you feel more female or feel more male. And this seems to be the case. Uh, there's been some quite recent studies looking at uh, transgender people, trans women, trans men, um, and there seem to be several uh, genes that have variants that are more common in one than the other. So I'll bet you there are lots and lots of genes there that uh, are not connected with the sex chromosomes, but they are connected with what we would call gender identity. I also think there's probably very much the case for mate preference too. You've probably all heard of the gay gene. Um, well, there's not one gay gene, there's a dozen gay genes. There could be hundreds of gay genes, but what I'd say is they're not gay genes, they're male-loving genes. And there's, I bet there's 100 male-loving genes and 100 female-loving genes, because we know that in fruit flies, uh, the mate preference is, is heavily selected. So all these genes are trying to get into the next generation, and one way of doing that is to go along with genes that actually enhance the prospects of a female passing on her genes. So uh, there's a huge amount of variation at every, uh, every, every point. A lot of variation in, actually in making the gonads, a lot of variation in hormonal, a lot of variation in the expression of genes in the brain and how that's expressed in the behaviour of humans. Well, back to sex chromosomes. Sex chromosomes are really weird. Um, they're not a pair in any sense. They look completely different. Um, but in fact, the very top little bit is shared, is completely identical and actually crosses over at meiosis. It's called the pseudo-autosomal region because it behaves just like an ordinary pair of chromosomes. So we know that these chromosomes were once upon a time the same. Well, what about the rest of the X? The rest of the X has got about a thousand genes on it and they do all kinds of things. So it's not a dedicated female chromosome at all. Um, so there's many, many different uh, genes. There's colour vision genes, there's, there's um, genes for musculature, all kinds of different genes. But there's too many genes that have something to do with sex and reproduction and too many genes that have something to do with intelligence. There's at least five times more genes that are um, affected in mentally retarded children, for instance, on the X chromosome than you would expect by chance. And the really weird thing is that some of these are the same genes. And I call these brains and balls genes because they're expressed in the testes and in the brain. So what do you make of that? Well, that's my cartoon of the X chromosome, which is uh, an intelligent and sexy chromosome. It's just my smart and sexy X chromosome. Well, the Y chromosome is completely different because it, it's very small, and it's hardly got any active genes on it. Most of it all is what we would have called junk DNA, highly repetitive DNA that just kind of stuffs things up. Uh, there's actually only 27 genes on that other part of the Y chromosome, which is specific to males. There's many copies of some of them, so you'll hear people say, oh, there's 100 genes on it, but actually they're mostly copies of these 27, and a lot of them don't work. So it's a bit of a disaster area, the Y chromosome. Uh, there's mo many copies, most of them are inactive, but a lot of these genes do have male-specific functions. And we know of several, for instance, that are vital for making sperm. So having them on the Y chromosome is very sensible because um, females are not interested in making sperm. So it's a very unusual chromosome, but it's mostly a genetic wasteland. Um, one of these genes, of course, is SRY, and so even though there's only 27, they're pretty potent. This is probably one of the most important genes for uh, defining differences between people. So uh, my cartoon of the Y chromosome is a, it's a bit of a wimp. So you've got to ask, well, why are they so weird? Is it so they work better? 
or is it some horrible uh, evolutionary accident? And I'm here to tell you, yes, it is a horrible evolutionary accident, and the Y chromosome is um, the, at the brunt of this. So let me explain to you how we think that sex chromosomes uh, originate. And this is not um, my work. This was actually suggested 100 years ago for Drosophila, for fruit flies. So the idea was that once upon a time, the X chromosome were an ordinary pair of chromosomes, had nothing to do with sex, and they swapped over bits of themselves, and that's what my little dotted line is, um, showing what parts recombine, until one day, one partner acquires a male-determining gene. And for uh, mammals, we think that's SRY. That's the kiss of death of that chromosome because what happens, because it's always um, in a male, is that other male advantage genes accumulate around it. So genes that could, might be an advantage in male might make sperm, for instance. Um, and what that means is to keep those male-specific genes together, you suppress recombination with the X chromosome, so it keeps this package together. So you get a whole lot of a, a whole region which doesn't recombine, and that's the break in my little dotted line there. And you probably know that um, not recombining is really bad for a, a genome. It starts accumulating junk DNA, it, um, it inactivates genes, it gets deleted genes, and so that region degrades very, very rapidly. Uh, and so you lose genes, you lose gene activity, and you end up with a lot of repetitive sequence. And that pretty much explains human sex chromosomes today. The top bit is still the same, but the other bit of the Y chromosome has hardly any genes left on it. So that can keep on going. Uh, if you keep on degrading and degrading the Y chromosome, you end up with a Y that has no homology with the X at all, and that's the way it is in marsupials. So that's one reason that it, it's been so good to study marsupials. Uh, but you can keep on degrade it, and so the Y chromosome could completely disappear. And this has actually happened in some rodents that I'll finish up talking about. So the, the lesson here is that the Y is a degraded X chromosome. Now, if the Y is a degraded X, you would expect genes on the Y chromosome to, be, uh, to have evolved from genes on the X, and that's pretty much true. Uh, 20 out of 27 of those genes have copies on the X, and these are just three that we happen to have discovered, the X, um, the X born homologs. So these two genes down the bottom are both spermatogenesis genes, um, and they both have copies on the X chromosome. Uh, even SRY has a copy on the X chromosome, that SOX3 that I told you about earlier. Uh, well, SOX3 doesn't have anything to do with sex today. In fact, it seems to be in a region that's involved with mental retardation and spermatogenesis. So what happened? Well, interestingly enough, all these genes are brains and balls genes, and it seems that they've been repurposed once they've got marooned on the Y chromosome, into genes that are involved in spermatogenesis. So they're all interesting evolutionary stories, and I'm just going to tell you about SRY itself. Um, so SOX3 is a very ancient gene. You can find it in a frog. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't determine sex itself, but it hangs around. Uh, it seems to be active in the brain, but it's also active in germ cells not the somatic part of the testis, not uh, the, the part that determines a testis, but in the sperm. Um, but interestingly, if it's accidentally expressed in the potential gonad, you get babies who are male but have no Y chromosome. So it looks like SOX3 can act like SRY if it's expressed in the testis. So years ago, what I suggested was what happened was that you had a breakage in the ancestral SOX3, and then you stuck onto it uh, another bit of DNA with a gene that has a sequence in it that drives the expression of that gene into the gonad. And that's where SRY came from. So you get a new function now, which is testis determination. So you can see 
it's actually very easy to make new sex determining genes. And we now have many, many examples of genes that we can follow uh, through evolution who, which have become sex determining just by a change, a very minor change here in the tissue in which it's expressed. <laughs> He's called Cool Wu. <laughs> <laughs> he just needs a cigarette, I think. Uh, so I want to just tell you um, how the X and the Y chromosomes originated. And we found this out by looking at kangaroos. So what we did was to uh, look at the position of genes that we knew were on the X chromosome in humans. Where are they in a kangaroo? So here are the two genes, and they're both on the X chromosome in humans, and they're both close together on the X chromosome in kangaroos too. So we kept on mapping and mapping, um, and what we found out was that this was true of all the genes in the bottom part of the human X, but not the top. They actually were on chromosome 5, along with ZFY. And we also did some chromosome painting. Uh, one of my students did this, and I said it would never work worked beautifully. Um, he was relieved to, to find that he had only one X chromosome and he painted it with a kangaroo X chromosome. So you can see the bottom is painted, it's the same but the top's not. And so what this meant was that the human X chromosome looks like there are two bits of it. Um, one is on a chromosome 5 in a kangaroo and the other's on the X. And so what this could have meant was either the ancestor um, had it in two bits or they spit up in marsupials. So we mapped it also in birds and we found there were different blocks in birds. And so it looks like there are two ancestral blocks that got together. And it was interesting when we looked at the elephant, the elephant has the same X chromosome, same genes in the same order as humans, uh, but the centrum is in a different place and is right between the old bit and the new bit. So it looks like what happened was two chromosomes, uh, one was the X and the other was a non-sex chromosome, got together and fused. And that's where our X chromosome came from. Now the really interesting thing is if you look at, in, uh, at the Y chromosome in humans, it's practically all green. So there's hardly any genes that come from the ancient part of the X chromosome. Or practically all the genes come from the green bit, which we know was not a sex chromosome. So if it weren't for that addition, probably we would have lost our Y chromosome a long time ago. So most of the human X chromosome evolved from this added region. And that was a, a real shocker to people who had great belief in our Y chromosome. Well, going on towards platypuses, so we're getting further and further away from humans. Um, we thought, well, you know, we'll do the same thing with the platypus. We'll look at males, we'll look at females, we'll find out what pair of chromosomes um, do sex. So we did that and here's a female, everything's paired. Uh, but when we looked at males, there are actually 10 chromosomes that don't have pairs. So we said, well, that's ridiculous. You can't have sex, 10 sex chromosomes, but you can. Uh, there are five X chromosomes and five Y chromosomes. So this is a really, really crazy system, and the New York Times um, had loads of fun, saying, well, what's a poor little baby platypus supposed to do if it's got a mixture of Xs and Ys? Um, it's, so what actually happens is that all these chromosomes line up in a chain at meiosis, and all the Xs go to one pole and make a sperm with five Xs, and all the Ys go to the other pole and make a sperm with all Ys. And so it actually works perfectly sensibly. It's a crazy way to do it, but it works. And evolution doesn't care how it works, as long as it does work. So that's the way it does in platypuses. We thought, well, that is crazy, but still, I bet you know, the human X is in there somewhere. So we did a lot of mapping, and by that stage we had sequencing too, and we asked, well, are any of these sex chromosomes the same as a human X? And the answer is no, absolutely not, completely different. In fact, our sex chromosome um, is exactly the same as chromosome 6 in a platypus, which is not a sex chromosome. So that was a bit of a shock. And what we found out was that, in fact, if you compare these sex chromosomes to bird sex chromosomes, 
Both sex chromosomes are in green, and you can see there's green all over the place. So it looks like there's a considerable homology to bird sex chromosomes in platypuses. So <laughs> that's my four-letter telegram is platypus is furry bird, <laughs> as far as sex chromosomes go anyway. Uh, well, what is the sex-determining gene? It's not SIY because um, it, the, sex, the sex chromosome doesn't have SOX3 on it. Uh, it looks as if it might be another gene entirely called AMH, that's the anti-malarian hormone, and that's really interesting because some fish have that as a sex-determining gene, and it's on just one of those Y chromosomes. So we think we know how it works, uh, but that was pretty unexpected. Uh, so, well, going further away from humans, what about birds and reptiles? Uh, we've known for a long time that birds have sex chromosomes too, but they're completely the opposite to humans. It's the males who have two copies of a big chromosome with lots of genes on it, and females that have only one copy of that and a pathetic little chromosome called the W, which is female-specific. Uh, well... It's a completely different chromosome from um, the human sex chromosome. There's no homology at all. So when we looked at emus, what we found was that the Z chromosome is completely the same, but the W chromosome is actually big, almost as big as, as the Z, and it's just got one tiny little bit which is full of, of rubbish. So what's a sex-determining gene? Um, well, it's not SIY. Um, it seems to be a completely different gene called DMRT1, which is a really interesting gene because, again, it's sex-determining in some fish as, as well, and it's got something to do with sex even in fruit flies. Uh, and so what we think happened is that originally this was a, a, an autosome, but it became a sex chromosome as the W chromosome, the female-specific chromosome now, uh, has a, a mutation in it. So DMRT1 is on the Z chromosome, but not on the W. And we think it's the dosage of that gene that does sex. Two copies and you're male, one copy and you're female. And so what presumably happened way back 180 million years ago is that there was a mutation of DMRT1 on one chromosome, and that set up dosage imbalance between the sexes. And there's now a lot of work showing that this is really what happened. Well, what about snakes? Snakes also have ZZ males, ZW females, and I um, unfortunately bet uh, that they were the same. They're not. <laughs> they, these, the Z in snakes is equivalent to the bird chromosome too, so a completely different system, but it works in the same way, and we don't actually know what the sex-determining gene is in a snake. So putting all this together... Uh, we can go back, back, back in time to about um, 310 million years uh, and we can figure out what the chromosomes looked like 300 million years ago by comparing all these chromosomes. And we can say, well, there are five patches of this genome that have sex-determining qualities in different vertebrate. Uh, so if we look at the lineage here, we can see that the snake ZW came from that yellow bit chromosome 5. The bird ZW chromosome came from the red chromosome, chromosome 2. Um, and there's still a lot of that chromosome left in, in the platypus, uh, but there's another little bit that has the AMH gene, and that's the aqua bit. Uh, but in marsupials, you have a completely different chromosome that became an XY, and that's a chromosome with SOX3 on it that became SIY. And in placental mammals, you've got the green bit stuck on the top, and it's not sex-determining, but it's part of our sex chromosomes. Well, the nice thing is that you can now figure out when things happened. Uh, so, uh, obviously, SRY was invented somewhere between here, and that means it's actually quite a new chromosome. And that really surprised people because everybody assumed that our sex chromosomes were very, very old indeed. They're not very old. They're only about 166 million years old. That's not very old in evolutionary terms. So let's have a talk about the future of human sex chromosomes. And we know that the Y is a degraded X. We've got to ask, well, why does the Y degrade? Um, 
Well, first of all, there's high variation. The testis is a very dangerous place to be. There's a, a lot of, uh, of cell division going on, and there's not a lot of DNA repair, and so you get a lot of mutation occurring in, in the testis. Um, and of course, the Y chromosome, the poor old Y, is stuck in the testis by definition. The other thing is the selection doesn't work very well because it doesn't recombine and you don't have any repair. And so you can't select one bit of the Y um, if you're stuck with the other bit of the Y as well. You're selecting the whole chromosome and that means you're selecting the bad with the good. And that's why the poor old Y gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, but we can calculate how long it's got to go because we know that 166 million years ago there was about a thousand genes on it and now there's only 51. So you can work out the number of genes lost um, and you can figure out well how many get lost every million years which is about six and there are only 51 genes there counting the pseudoautosomal ones and so at that rate um, the Y will disappear in about eight million years. There it goes. <laughs> Poof. So what's going to happen? Uh, will males disappear? Uh, or will we become pathogenetic females? Will it be a f all female species like whiptail lizards, for instance? Well, that can't happen because there are these imprinted genes that must come through sperm in order to be active. So we need males and we need sperm or we'll become extinct. Well, is there any possibility of inventing new sex-determining genes? And I'd say, well, um, yes. And there's good news is that it's happened in a couple of rodent lineages. That these are, are little spiny rats, and they live on little islands in Japan. Um, and one of them have, has a perfectly good Y chromosome with SIY on it. But the other two, both males and females, have a single X and no Y. So how do they do it? Very, very recent data suggests that they have, uh, they have changed the control of the SOX9 gene. So it looks like SOX9 is going to be the next sex-determining gene in these spiny rats. So it's possible to invent a new sex-determining gene, and that's happened in spiny rats and presumably could happen in people. So what, what's going to happen um, if... Uh, you know, XX woman uh, mates with a spiny rat man. Uh, well, that's not going to work very well because there'll be a war of the sex genes, you know, who's dominant, and may, me male, you female, uh, and you're going to end up with a lot of infertility and maybe intersexuality, and these are the classic conditions for pushing species apart. So if you come back in eight million years, you might find either no humans, or you might find several different human species. So that could be a scary thing to contemplate if we last eight million years, that is. And I suspect this has actually already happened uh, because we've already had a new SRY defined new sex chromosomes, and I suspect that's probably what caused the budding off of monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. What, that's what caused the divergence. And monotremes went their own way. Uh, and then the addition of a, a bit to uh, the placental X and Y could have been another thing that forced these species apart. So I think the whole uh, history of, uh, of mammalian speciation could have a great deal to do with sex chromosome um, evolution. So I have to say, I think that's pretty important. So in conclusion, uh, everything, there's a lot of variety at every stage, and I think people haven't really taken that into consideration. So there's, if you look at humans and all the other animals, there's incredible variety. There's temperature, there's genes, there are different genes, which is kind of funny when you think about it, because sex is really important. We're not going to uh, survive as a species without it. You think that it would be very conserved, and it's absolutely not. Um, 
The human sex gene, we know there's SRY, but we also know now that it's a very complicated uh, pathway in which it has its effect on the testis, and there's more complexities downstream in hormones, and there's more complexity still in the target organs. Uh, the surprising thing is our sex chromosomes are pretty young, and the, they're degrading fast, and the degrading Y chromosome could be lost in eight million years. Um, we may well extinct ourselves well before eight million years. We've only been humans for 100,000 years after all. Uh, and so we have to ask, well, whether we're, as a human race, we're heading for extinction or we're heading for speciation. And I hope you're convinced um, in the value of looking at um, mammals other than humans and mice in order to find out new things about humans. So I just wanted to uh, show you the pictures of the people who actually did all this work over 30 years or more. Um, I had uh, wonderful students and wonderful postdocs who uh, dedicated their lives to weird creatures like echinas or emus or snakes. Um, and so uh, thank you very much and I'd be happy to take questions. And there's a picture of the gene loci on the X and the Y for your, <laughs> your, your pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Fantastic presentation, Jenny. We are definitely going to take some questions. There's already a whole bunch that have come in here. Um, while there is some valuable information to get there, we might just briefly pop up the QR code and the link again, if we could, just so we can have that question. Don't forget, of course, in the meantime, while, we're, while you're thinking of your questions, we will be back next month for another Briz Science. We're not quite ready to announce the speaker yet, but it will be a stellar talk. So make sure you come along to that one out in October. And, of course, sign up to our mailing list and to our website so you can be notified of all these talks in advance. All right. So questions are coming through. Let's go down to the bottom here. All right, we're going to start with the first question from Kate, which was, why is the sex of crocodiles and turtles determined by temperature from an evolutionary perspective? Oh, good question. I, I ask my um, ecological friends this all the time, um, and there are many uh, alternative answers. The one I like best is that it's kind of a population regulation device because with alligators... Um, uh, alligator females prefer to make their nests down on, by the water where it's cool. So this will be female producing nests. Um, now when there's a lot of alligators, a lot of eggs hatch, uh, they can't all get down to the levee, so they're forced to build their nests on the top of the levees where it's hot, and these are male producing nests. So it looks like when the, there aren't many alligators around, you get a lot of females being hatched, uh, when there are lots of alligators around, um, you get a lot of males and they all fight each other and the best one wins and their genes win. So it's sort of a population regulation device. Brilliant. Okay, um, next question here uh, from Rudy. You mentioned XX males. Are there examples of XY females? Yes, there are. Uh, there's several different kinds of XY females. There are XY females who have a Y chromosome that's actually missing the top bit, uh, so it doesn't have an SRY gene on it. And there's um, XY females who have a mutation in the SRY gene, so it, it doesn't work, um, and, and so they grow up as females. And there's also an, a number of uh, genetic mutations. Uh, for instance, I, I won't put it up, but there's a, a gene um, that actually countermands the SOX9 gene. And if it doesn't work um, enough, you don't countermand that gene and you get a testis even though there's no SRY. So there's quite a number of different variants um, in which the Y chromosome, uh, the SRY gene is not there or it doesn't work or there are other genes that tip this balance. So it's a balance. And if that balance tips it the other way, you get XY uh, females and XX males. Right. Um, Alice asks... Uh, oh, okay. Will the new rat's sex chromosome, I'm assuming this is those the rats at the end, similarly degrade? 
yes, I'm sure it will. I'm, I'm come back in 20 million years and <laughs> just show I'm right. Uh, but all sex chromosomes degrade. Um, so right across the spectrum, you know, earthworms and flies and every, everything that has a d uh, differentiated sex chromosomes generally degrade. Sometimes very, very rapidly in uh, Drosophila, you know, it can be just one or two million years. Sometimes it's very slow and we don't quite understand. For instance, emu sex chromosomes are almost the same. Uh, whereas chicken and zebra finch sex chromosomes, the, the W is very small. And we, that might be because um, emus take longer to reproduce, so they, they have a longer cycle than some of the other birds. I, I suspect that that's not the whole reason, but we'd love to know more about what regulates the rate of degradation. Um. We've got a couple of different questions along the theme of genes for homosexuality and how they have been conserved for so long given that um, they, they typically don't have progeny. Uh, you able to, are you touched on that a little bit in your talk about... Um... That, that's a really interesting question. I have my own views and I'm not sure there's a great deal of data out there. But to an evolutionary geneticist, there's no mystery at all. There will be genes that regulate everything, in, including mating behaviour. And that we know that's highly regulated in birds, for instance. So, you know, we would expect it was highly regulated in humans as well. Um, the only thing that, that people think, well, that's strange, is how frequent it is. It's very, very frequent gene. And as you say, if gay men don't have as many children as straight men, you would expect this, this gene to die out. And it obviously has not. And my suggestion is that what we're looking at is gay genes being male-loving genes in a male um, who will be homosexual and have fewer kids, but his sisters and his aunts uh, will have the same genes, and they'll probably mate earlier and have more kids. So I think, again, there's a balance in um, the number of children left by gay men and their female relatives that seems to be uh, keeping a fairly high level of that gene in the population. Um, this is what we call sexual antagonism, and it's very common. There's lots of genes that have different effects in different sexes. So I, I suspect that gay genes are just, you know, typical sexually, uh, sexually antagonistic genes. Great response. Okay, a um, couple more questions. We're almost out of time, but Ellen asks, how do you extract or observe chromosomes, and can they be damaged in the process? So maybe sort of going back to some of the basics. Yes, um, well, chromosome, um, looking chromosome is, is quite an art form. <laughs> you probably, you might have looked at onion tip chromosomes or something in first year biology where you simply squash them until they're very, very flat and then you stain up the uh, protein or the DNA with something that's really bright. Um, but it's, it's not easy and it's an art that I fear is getting lost. Uh, because getting beautiful chromosomes, um, it, we know how to do it, but it's fiddly. It's, it's a bit of an art form. So uh, we often, for instance, use blood cells. Um, so there are some blood cells that have chromosomes, not red blood cells, you get rid of those. So you, you can um, grow blood cells in culture and then you can fix them in a mixture of acetic acid and methanol. So um, they're, they're not living anymore, but that means you can flatten them very easily and look with a microscope. And so you get them all laid out beautifully. And um, I have one more question for you, which is you're obviously returning to Briz Science from you know, nearly 20 years ago that you were last here. So I'd be interested in your views. If you come back for the next, in 20 years, for the next Briz Science in 2042, um, what do you think you might be sharing? What sort of new breakthroughs might we expect or new knowledge gain over the next 20 well, years? Well, I hope you'll give me a, a, a birthday cake for my 100th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a date. We're, we're done. Um, I mean, it's going to be a really exciting few years. A lot of the omics techniques are just 
unbelievable. I mean, I can't believe that we're sequencing um, whole species. We're getting beautiful sequence for, you know, three or $4,000 instead of 80 million. That's a huge change. But we're also able to look at how these genes act. And that's a big mystery, not what genes are there and where are they so much, but how do they act? What turns them off and on? And we're beginning to know all about lots of different signals that turn them off and on. And the techniques that I'm really excited about are those that actually can look at a single cell, one cell. What are you doing down there, cell? What kind of cell are you? Where are you? Uh, where did you come from? I think all, all these techniques are going to allow us to track individual cells in tissues. Um, and it's, it's going to be a lot more complicated than we, th we thought. But it might really give us some very basic understanding. Well, I can't wait to hear that next talk. If it's just as good as this one, it'll be a fantastic bridge science in that day. For now, can you please put your hands together for Jenny Graves. Thank you so much, Jenny, and a very small token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you all next month. And please join us on the deck for some food and drink. <laughs>